everybody. I'm Carissa Hunt Button from 7th Street Gifts at the Lawrenceburg Public Library here for the Year of Flowers. And this month of May is going to be the flower of red clover. First, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring the kits and the YouTube videos. And secondly, I'd like to thank you for checking them out and expressing interest in our Year of Flowers program. So again, today we're going to talk about red clover, which kind of fun and exciting about this is I bet you nine out of 10 people who are watching this, if not 10 out of 10, have a patch of it growing in their yard, their woods, or have a place that they can go and collect it and wild craft it from um, free of pesticides and other worries as far as like pet excrement and things of that nature. Um, you see the bees love it, right? And then a lot of farmers plant it as a cover crop to um, keep their soil fertile and re-nitrogenize it over um, winters and fall crops times. So their new spring and summer um, crops will have the soil nutrients that they need. So it's very common, very easy to grow, and super user friendly and safe to ingest and work into your home apothecary. So again, what we're gonna use today is red clover, and its botanical name is Trifolium pretens. Now it is in the legume family, which is a very close first cousin to peas and beans. Um, and it's a primarily a nutritive flower or botanical or herb. So it has other qualities too, as like a blood cleanser and a lymphatic mover, but today we're mainly gonna talk about its nutritional qualities and its content is a way to work in really hard to find trace minerals and perfect combinations of vitamins to your diet. So the flower as a whole is very nutritionally complex. So it has so many things in it and little traces and pinches that only work when they're combined together in the perfect amount. Um, so the best way, in my humble opinion, is to use the red clover flower in an unadulterated form. And so that's just a fancy way of saying using the whole flower head and the petals and the leaves um, instead of extracting it or making like a supplement out of it, okay? It's so nutritionally dense that, again, we plant it for soil and then it's also planted as an animal um, fodder crop. I know I buy or have in the past little bags of dried red clover for our rabbits and for our goats is like a treat. So if you think of it that way, if anybody consumes meat, right, in any, any way, shape, or form, or even a vegetable, so think of a soybean or a vegetable, like green bean or a pea that was grown in a crop that had red clover over it, or you consume an animal that ate red clover as a primary source of food, that would be secondary nutrition, right? So we already consume red clover on a lot of levels. Anytime we eat a green bean or a pea or a piece of um, poultry or beef that has consumed or used the nutritional value from the soil, um, we have consumed the nutritional value of it in a secondary form. So what we're going to think of it today is let's use it as a main source. So that means not as a secondary source of not eating a plant or vegetable that grew in soil that red clover nourished or eating an animal that ate red clover and then consuming its meat. Let's start with the number one primary of the actual whole red clover itself. And again, it is high in nutritional content. This thing is loaded with every sort of vitamin, mineral, and trace nutrient that you can think of. It's easy to dry, and it can be consumed fresh as well. So if you want to go out when they start to bloom and pick the little flower heads and rinse them and like sprinkle them and pull them apart and put them in your salad or garnish, really anything that you want to garnish with, you um, can safely eat them, no problem. And then they're also really easy to dry. And since a lot of these can be wild crafted or harvested in our own fields and our own pieces of property or woodlands, I'm gonna briefly talk about um, easy DIY folk drying techniques. So you'll be able to dry and store your own red clover or other flowers that have nutritional content. Now when we do dry, I'll touch back up on this again, we wanna retain color. So if you dry a flower or a plant and you still have its color, then that equals nutritional content or value. When it starts to get completely brown or dry and you can't see a hint of the color any longer, that means its shelf life has probably expired in the sense of nutritional quality and content. 
And you'll see the red clover in your bag, um, your one ounce, and it's a big fluffy um, ounce because you'll also be able to notice how different botanicals are dense, where an ounce of something might be this big, where an ounce of clover in your bag would be this big or this full. They'll have the pretty purple hues and the reddish hues on them, and then you'll also be able to see that even though the greens are a little brown, all in all, they're still maintaining most of its green color. You see very few brown or off-colored pieces of clover or leaf in there. And that's a sign that A, it was dried properly, and B, that it still maintains a lot of the nutritional value and content and is a good way to store it and keep it shelf stable for the fall and winter when it's not everywhere. So I'm going to turn this around to remind us of uses and keep me on track. And then real quickly, I'm going to show you a way to harvest and clean your own red clover. Because again, what's so fun and exciting about this is it's so nutritionally dense and it's super easy to find and it's super easy to plant too. So a lot of you guys might have like tobacco or corn crops and you put a cover or a fodder crop over of red clover in the fall or the spring. Well, there's absolutely no reason instead of just tilling that all under that you couldn't harvest the top and have a commerce of your red clover. So now this came from my yard. Unfortunately, we don't have the flowers yet. It's a little early, right? But we're going to pretend that it's a month ahead of time and these all have these big purple, red, beautiful bumblebee loving blooms on them that we're all accustomed to. And then I bet a lot of you will notice these big thick leaves and the larger size clover and the variegation. And that's a form of the red clover that's a little bit different than the smaller white clovers or the other ground cover clovers that we may see as well. So this is a super easy way to just give everything a quick rinse just to free itself of a little debris or a little bug or something. Look, I have a little ant climbing here. And here it is. What I like to do, and this is really quick, fast and furious, is fill a bowl up with as cold water as I can. Um, if I had ice, I would put ice in here because we don't want it warm, even room temperature or hot. It'll kind of wilt, and then heat can also sometimes leach or pull out some of the nutrition or mineral content of your botanical. That's why we like it when we come back to make a tea or to sane or add it to a broth, but not when we're trying to clean it to preserve it for a shelf-stable use later. And then I like just a little bit of white salad vinegar. And this is also good if your stuff um, kind of wilts a little bit, like you pick it in the morning and then you are going to do a fun dinner or salad and you want to garnish with some fresh and um, use some fresh along with dry and it gets a little wilted and maybe doesn't look as perky and pretty as you want. This white vinegar and ice cold water will bounce things right back. I have store-bought produce too, like lettuce and things, but certainly anything you wildcraft or harvest. It'll give it a second wind and take that wilting out of it and give you the presentation that you want for like a pretty salad or something. And I just put maybe, what do you think, two or three tablespoons, just a little glove of the white vinegar. And these are just freshly picked along my fence line. And certainly you would be mindful of spraying and pets and all those sorts of things that we've already touched on. But this is such an abundant, free-growing botanical in our area, I feel confident that we could all find a safe place to harvest some. And if you're worried, just plant your own. You can get the seeds really inexpensively at your farm store. You don't even have to go to a seed catalog or a fancy store and plant a small little patch in your own yard. Now, I, this is how I like to do it. I usually wouldn't pull up the roots of my clover. I just happened to this morning by mistake, but generally I snip them off right at the base. And then again, we're going to imagine that these have the blossoms that we all know and love on them. Take the stems and just kind of bundle them. And then I just do a really quick dunk and drip, and that usually rinses off any little particles of dust or dirt or the occasional ant or spider or basically anything undesirable. And you'll see a lot of it beads up and just comes right off, and that's fine. And then the vinegar, too, will help cut through any little, like, grime or oil or sediment that are on there without altering the integrity of the nutrition. And then I like newspaper to work on as a surface. 
I'm going to leave this right here. It's like a secondary drying option. And then just a good old paper towel. And if you have nice cheesecloth or muslin or something like that you'd rather use, um, certainly use that. And next month we're going to talk about drying screens. So that's just a little prelude. And we'll talk about how to make really simple screens and do your own botanical drying all summer when our um, yards and woods and gardens are just full of everything wonderful. So, so simple. And then you can eat this and store it and dry it without any concern. Oh, and usually sometimes too with like dandelion, I'll see like a little sediment of dirt. And this is already pretty clean, but I do see like a couple little like dandelion hairs. Maybe like a little bug leg or something on there. And then you want to spread it out. You don't want things to stack on top of one another. That's sort of important with botanical drying because that's where you can foster mold and bacteria. It's easier um, for a perfect yield and a really good result to do a few small batches where everything's really spread out and able to dry than to do one big batch where it's kind of mounded up and the things that get into the center might not reach the sun and the light the way we want and you would have like a moldy core. So what I, I would encourage you to do really small user-friendly batches with your rinsing and your drying instead of doing one huge harvester batch all at once. Yeah, not too much. That's pretty good. Oh, and I see a few flecks of dirt. So that's kind of fun because you can see what comes off in it. And then these are too good to waste. I'm just going to kind of float a little bit. And I'll submerge them and pull them out in one second. I'll let those sit for a sec. Then I like to put another layer of paper towel or muslin or cheesecloth on it, particularly when we've really submerged it and gotten everything wet like we just did. I do a little tamp or a pat dry. Turn it over. And again, we want to really spread things out. And this would be the time if you wanted to and had the time. I won't do them all now since time is of the essence, but you would kind of destem it. And the stems are fine to eat. Nutritionally, they're just kind of chewy and fibrous and they have a bit of a bitter flavor and I don't know, an undesirable texture. So we're just gonna focus on the flowers and the little leaf heads. So again, we're gonna just imagine that this is a fresh flower. Then another tamper pat. I'm going to put a dry paper towel on again after I use this to absorb not all but a lot of the moisture. And then I'm going to do a newspaper sandwich. Too. It keeps it if you're in your house and you've got this like on your kitchen counter or you want to put it out on your picnic table, maybe weight it with like a few stones or something like that and harness the solar energy of the day and just the airflow. It'll keep other things from falling on it again, like pet hair or pollen or just uh, things that carried in the air, other seeds and things of that nature. Kind of give it a shelter, but it's real porous. And remember, it's sandwiched between two paper towels and then it has newspaper beneath it and on top of it. Then you can kind of do like a layer. I'm going to show you these in a minute. These are what your bag is going to have in it. Oh yeah, and this one shows a little bit more undesirable de debris and little specks of dirt and things we'd rather not store and have. And then again, 
We're going to imagine the blossoms are mixed in there with our beautiful clover leaves. We're going to spread things out because we don't want that wet core or center. We want everything to be thoroughly dry. Now we can consume these fresh, but that would be that day and that minute. And remember for tincturing, for adding to oils and salves, and anything that we do at 7th Street Gifts, we consider water a potential contaminant. So I am an advocate for bone dry botanical use. And now most of us have a nice sunny window or win window sill or a counter that that time maybe at, from four to five o'clock the sun hits that particular part of your countertop. You know, we all know our homes and our own apothecary kitchens. And this would be a good way to kind of move it around and you don't want your drying botanicals to be exposed directly to sunlight, particularly the flowers, like the clover that we're talking about. We're not talking about like a sun-dried tomato or something like that but we still want the heat and the drying effect of the sun. So if you keep it sheltered with the newspaper and the paper towels, but still allow the sun to hit it and warm it up, you kind of get the best of both. Now a little batch like this, I would probably turn and press. You can keep pressing it because your paper towels will dry out, especially if you put it in a sunny spot that we talked about, for about two to three days. And you want it so when it's ready to store as a shelf stable dry botanical, you want your botanical heads to still retain that pretty purple color. You can see it. I mean, they don't look as bright when they're freshly picked, but this is in no way brown or dull. And you want to be able to take one and go like this and it just crumble into a million little steeples and pieces of petal. And when it does that, or you get your leaf and they start to curl your leaves at the end and curl inward, that's a sign that they're dry enough to store in a little glass, or I like these little Dollar Tree Tupperware containers. They're four ounces. They have little lids, user-friendly batches. And this would last every bit of a year, maybe longer. And then remember the color retention is how we correlate and um, know if our nutritional content is maintaining as well. So if you took these out a year later and they still had their purple and green and they weren't all brown and dry, they would be nutritionally intact and you could still eat them for their minerals and vitamins. Now another flower, it's similar to violet, that's out this year, at this time of year I should say, and a lot of us have it, not a wild flower but a cultivated, is our lilac. And these can be edible too. They just dry to such a light weight, very similar to a violet that it's not a huge commerce flower because it's hard to grow and dry enough of them to have enough to sell to really make any true amount of money. But you'll see how these dried. I dried these exactly how this technique with the vinegar rinse and look at the color retention. Now you could add these back to like a sugar cookie. You could work them into a frosting. You could just sprinkle them on for a natural color and they have, do a part like a nice floral flavor. But this is what I wanna show you. Look at this one. You see the brown color in it? And I dried it the same way, just for some reason, the nutrition didn't stay in it as well in the color. It was a weaker part of the botanical. And this is what you would see as a sign that it didn't hold its nutritional content or value when it starts to get those yellow or browning. But when it still has a nice vibrant color, you're good to go. So very similar, let's put your clovers there with it too. Versus like this one, probably not as nutritionally preserved and intact as this one. So you see, this is what we want, and this is less desirable, and it shows that the shelf life was probably expired as far as a dried botanical for color, aesthetic, and then most importantly, nutrition. You can also do the same thing with dandelion flowers. I wish we could do a month of dandelion flowers. Well, we could, but in commerce, they're very similar to the violets and lilacs. They dry to such a light weight 
that they're difficult to grow and dry and rinse and store enough of them to make them worth the, the time and effort money-wise. But we can certainly do this in our own afternoons in our own home. So these are examples of other things that we can dry very similar to and use like red clover. Now we're going to get back to our red clover and we're going to talk about uses. Now I made this one before we left. You would generally strain it, but I wanted you to see how the flowers rehydrated. They kind of just got full and plump again. And they also brought out a really nice imparted pale purple color. And then the leaves got like a green again too. So you can make a tea or tisane with red clover. And it's one of my favorite teas or tisanes that we use and drink nearly on a daily basis. It has a very mild flavor, even though it makes like a dark tea-like color. As dark as it is, it looks like it would taste like tea or have a stronger flavor. But in my opinion, it's nearly flavorless. So you could just drink a glass of ice cold red clover water or tea, and it wouldn't taste like much of difference in your regular water. It's also a really mild flavor to blend with other things like mint or chamomile, rose, um, a spearmint or a peppermint, any of the mint families or more astringent like a calendula or something like that that's kind of got more of a medicinal flavor. You could add a pinch to that and then let your red clover carry it because again it's a very mild, palatable, easy to take in flavor. It's all nearly flavorless. Another way to use it, and this is a way to just incorporate botanical health into your herbal apothecary while living a regular everyday life. So you could make a really nice tea, but technically it's a tisane, right? Because a tisane is a flower beverage that you drink as if it were a tea, but it doesn't actually have any tea, any Camilla sinensis in it. You make a big batch and you have some that day, and then you make a tray of ice cubes. And you keep the ice cubes in your freezer and I would generally let mine infuse or steep for a little bit longer and make it really strong and concentrated, maybe even up to 45 minutes to an hour. So it's a really strong, concentrated tisane with a dark, earthy brown color. Fill an ice cube tray up and then just keep it in your freezer. And then it's super easy to add to soups or water. So instead of using a plain ice cube, you could put two or three of your red clover ice cubes into your ice water or your lemonade or your tea that you drink like your sweet tea or your regular tea. You can also add it to soups. So like a condensed soup, if you're busy that day and you're just making a quick can of Campbell's or tomato or even a Progresso that night, you can take one or two of your ice cubes out and just throw it right into the soup and boost that nutritional content and use the botanicals that grow in your very own yard um, to make things taste and feel better, right? But I'm not saying that you can't add this, like we all have condensed soups, we all have nights where we're too busy to really cook. So instead of feeling bad about it or worrying about um, the nutritional content or eating like overly processed foods, just work these teas and tisane and botanicals into your everyday store-bought food and then it's like the best of both worlds. It's very, very good for convalescents. So people who are recovering from an illness or elderly people who have really fragile immune systems and digestive systems that might already take in a lot of soft foods like jellos, pudding, soups, and broths. It's very easy to make the tea into same base and use it for ice cubes, again, or for broths. Or you can even make um, jello. The water could be red clover water, like with the um, nursing and lactation that would carry over. Um, but yes, for menopausal symptoms. And the reason is, is red clovers are loaded with isoflavins. And so many of them, it's hard for even scientists who only study isoflavins to pick out every single one that red clover possesses. And isoflavins, especially in the high content and the combination found in red clover can act as an estrogen trigger, okay? So, or an oestrogenic activity. So it means that it can promote estrogen growth, which can be, or stimulation production, not growth, which can be a good thing if you're going through menopause and experiencing hot flashes and dryness, but not a good thing if you're expecting or trying to become pregnant or nursing. So all those isoflavins, again, act as an estrogen trigger 
and you do not want to use it for pregnancy or nursing, but you could certainly use it to treat menopausal symptoms. Most of the studies and supplements on the market today, there are a lot of like women's uh, menstrual regulation supplements that have high doses of red clover, um, menopausal supplements uh, that have high doses of red clover. But what I'd like to touch on with that is they're very isolated compounds of the red clover. They're not the entire plant. So when you look at the supplements or the like women's blends or the menopausal blends, they've lab treated the red clover and extracted those very specific isoflavins and estrogenic triggers out of the plant itself. So it's not a true representation of the entire red clover. And remember how we're going to try to eat it as a primary nutritional source, not a secondary. So that would go along with eating the entire plant, all comprised together, unadulterated, to harness that complex nutrition and not pick apart and pull out little components of the plant itself, okay? So another way to use red clover, especially this time of year, in about a month or two, we're going to see it everywhere, is to jelly it. And again, you would want to dry it before you jellied it and use a bone dry, but it makes a really pretty pastel, light purple jelly. Um, and then a garnish, I think we already touched on that. Now this can be used fresh, like if you pick them, you could add them to your salad or make a meal look fancy or even a cake. And then one of the biggest things about red clover externally, not internally as a nutritional supplement, is hair retention. It makes an incredible scalp treatment. So red clover isn't known to make hair grow. It's not a hair growth stimulant. But what it does do is it builds up the scalp and the hair follicles and it helps you retain and keep the hair that you grow. So if you're somebody that has a lot of shedding or you're going through a lot of stress or you've taken showers and you've just all of a sudden started to notice like way more hair in the drain and you can't figure out why you're losing more hair than you normally would, a scalp treatment with red clover is incredibly effective for hair retention. And so a nice simple way I like to do it, and I do this at the end of the day at night and sleep with it and then shampoo it out in the morning because obviously your hair and your scalp would seem greasy otherwise, is I just take a nice organic coconut oil. I like it because it is semi-solid and I feel like it's easy to store. And again, 100% bone dry botanical. Okay, you would not use wet or fresh because it could potentially foster mold or bacteria. And I would scoop or ladle it in. I had this melted, but it set up on me. I've talked too long. Um, um, you could warm it up room temperature or melt it real quick in the microwave and pour it liquid, or you could spoon it out and kind of paste it in. Now, I like to leave the red clover botanical on the bottom so you can see it and then kind of press the oil on top of it. You could also use olive oil, jojoba, um, apricot, any cosmetic grade or cooking oil that you have. I just happen to like the coconut because I like the thick texture of it. I feel like it's easy to press on top and get a nice clover infusion and get the air pockets out of it. And then after about four or five days of infusing the coconut oil, you'll see the red clover will throw up little plumes or streams. You'll see where it's starting to leach the mineral rich out of it and it turns like a purpley brown. And then that's when you know it's ready to use as a scalp treatment. You would just keep it um, by your bedside or wherever you want and then take it out at night and you would keep the flowers on the bottom and just go from the oil on top because trust me, all those minerals and nutrients and healing compounds have leached into that fat and oil. So you're good to go. And then just work it into as a really nice scalp treatment and let it sit on there all night long and then shampoo it out in the morning. Um, it has almost no scent, so it wouldn't like turn you off. It wouldn't be so strong. If you wanted to incorporate a drop or two of an essential oil like tea tree or peppermint, you could. You would want to be really uh, careful with your dilution if you incorporated essential oils. But it makes an incredibly good scalp treatment for hair retention and then also just like dandruff, psoriasis. If you just have kind of like a itchy scalp, this will heal it up like yesterday. And then a fun thing to do for nutrition, if you just want to use it simply, um, again, bone dry always, is you can infuse your cooking oils too. So obviously not if you added an essential oil or used it for your hair, but you could certainly use this organic coconut oil that's shelf stable and cooking um, food grade 
and do the same exact thing as we would for our hair or scalp treatment. Instead, you would just ladle out like a tablespoon or so for a saute or work it into a recipe. And you know you've basically nutritionally charged or infused a simple cooking oil. Again, once they're bone dry, you could also put it in like an olive oil and vinegar, like a salad dressing that you make on your own and allow the red clovers to just freely mix with the oils and sprinkle it on as a garnish for greens or any sort of salad, any way you would generally use a salad dressing or an oil and vinegar. So again, our ideas for the red clover that is in the pea and bean family, the legumes, right? Used as a cover crop and a nutritional fodder or feed for livestock is also equally nutritional to us humans in its primary form versus its secondary form. So you would consume it as a tea or a tisane, and you could drink it cold or hot. And remember, it has a light, mild, easily palatable flavor. You could allow that tea or tisane to steep just a little bit longer and make a really nice, strong concentrate and infusion and make ice cubes. Then your ice cubes, you could add to things as simple as condensed soups, um, just easy little broths, gravies, right? All sorts of things. And then you could also add your ice cubes to water, teas, lemonades, other things that you would normally add regular ice to. It's very good for convalescents or convalescing people who are on fragile diets anyway and have fragile immune systems, but not for pregnancy and nursing, but yes for menopause, right? So the maiden mother crone, Right? Maiden, yes. Crone, yes. Mother, no. The reason is it's loaded, loaded with isoflavins. So many that people who only study isoflavins have a hard time determining and, and isolating and finding exactly how many and which isoflavins red clover is full of. And isoflavins act as an estrogen trigger and they trigger ostrogenic activity, which can usually be good, but not if you're expecting. And again, most of the studies and the supplements on the market have very isolated compounds of the red clover plant, not the entire plant, because it has such a complex nutrition. And my suggestion to you is to ingest the entire plant as a whole, because it's really hard to isolate and extract and really get the true benefit of a botanical, in my humble opinion. You can jelly with it, especially if you have a lot on your homestead or in your farm or you are planting it as like a cover crop. Why not, um, instead of just tilling it under or getting ready of, rid of it, bring it in, dry it, and then jelly with it. A fresh garnish just for fun. If you go out to your garden and you peck your lettuce, lettuces and kale, why not go to the edge of the woods and get two or three clover heads and just sprinkle them on top? Externally, it's known as a hair retention and scalp treatments. Again, not growth, but retention. And then it's really, since it is so complex nutrition, nutritionally, it's a great thing to infuse in the cooking oils just to incorporate that little boost of nutrition into your everyday cooking or sauteing and just the things you do every day. We talked about an easy folk method to dry it the newspaper paper towel sandwich. And then next month, we're gonna talk about screen drying. We talked about color retention equals nutritional retention. So you want your colors in your dried botanicals to be bright, not pale and brown. And we also want to talk about the nutritionally complex complexity of the red clover and talk about using it as a primary versus a secondary form of nutrition. So it's easy to dry. It can be consumed fresh, but we would never incorporate it into an oil or store it fresh. Again, we want to retain the color and color retain, retention means nutritional retention. It's incredibly nutritionally complex. I know I've said it a lot, but you really can't like harness it's so good it has there's really not a bad thing to say about red clover and that's why we feed it the livestock you think if it keeps an animal healthy that only eats greens and it can re neutralize or re um, give soil a whole second life then it's got to be good to ingest into the human body too we're going to talk about it in its unadulterated form and that's how you'll use it in your kit and instead of secondary nutrition, we're going to talk about primary nutrition. 
and we're going to in harness and ingest the high nutritional content of the red clover. And I could go on and on about it, but it's easy to identify, right? So you would definitely want to be 110%, but it's a hard one to mix up or confuse with other things. It's easy to grow, easy to find, and just so darn good for you, I can't really say it enough. And it's a super palatable, mild flavor. So there's really no reason you couldn't just slowly start to work it into your herbal home apothecary and kitchen. So in conclusion, Lawrenceburg Public Library and 7th Street Gifts for the month of May did Red Clover, the Trifolium Pretense, and the Lagoon family. And you're going to use your one ounce to use in any way you want. You can follow up with questions uh, at the library or the website. And our shop reopens tomorrow after over a year being closed due to COVID, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, noon to 5. So if you want to take a trek up, trek up to the city, come to Newport, and we can talk about red clover all day long. And it sells for about $4 an ounce. So also think about it. If you've got fields of it growing, it could potentially be a commerce crop. I mean, I buy it. So consider it as a, maybe a, side, a little side gig for your land. Until then, enjoy your red clover, stay well, and we'll talk next month with the flower of jasmine.